So what we developed over the years was two models. One is four steps to talk about anything, anywhere, anytime without fighting or conflict. And then the other piece, which will be easier to, to speak to for your question, is around how to lay down your emotional weapons. And we have identified seven major emotional weapons. And the biggest one that we really help people, uh, couples attack first is blaming. This is episode number 543 with Sean Haywood, how to bulletproof your relationship. Sean is an awesome guest. She is a nomadic <laughs> traveler. She has been on the road for nine years with her husband and they work together. They live together. She helps people have amazing relationships and you're going to want to stay tuned for this episode of Last First Date Radio. Welcome back. I'm Sandy Weiner. We believe it is never too late to go on your last first date to, to support you on your journey to lasting love. I wrote a book and it's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And whether you're single or in a relationship, you're going to be inspired to play a bigger game and succeed in all areas of your life and your love life. There are many, many tips to help you be as confident from the inside out as you can be to show up, stand up and speak up in your life. And you can find it on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. Every week I bring you a tip from the book. This week's tip is don't make assumptions. This is probably one of the number one things that I talk about in my coaching practice and also in my Facebook group, Your Last First Date. We tend to jump to these conclusions about people and not get curious. I just had an experience this week with somebody who I was talking to on an online dating app. And I was talking to him on a Saturday night. He didn't ask me any questions. And I felt like, okay, let me leave this till tomorrow and see if this goes anywhere and decide if I'm going to respond or not. And the next morning I got a text from him. Well, it looks like you're not interested. So have a good life. And he just detached, unmatched. Wow. And I didn't even have a chance to respond to him. But he seemed like a lovely person until he just decided that I was not ever going to talk to him. And we tend to do this. We, we make assumptions about people. So my challenge to you this week is to get curious. Before you jump to a conclusion about somebody, even if it triggers something in you, just ask questions because you may be very pleasantly surprised. And before I bring my guest, Sean, on today, I want to just give a shout out to my Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date. And we are a group for women over 40 who are looking for lasting love and would like to grow into lasting love, not just sit there and complain about why dating isn't working and why men suck and all the other stuff that people do in most Facebook groups that are not monitored or managed well. And my group has seven monitors. They each monitor one day of the week. I come in, I do live videos, I post all my articles and very engaging groups. So join us there at your last first date. And now for my guest, Dr. Sean Haywood. She's the founder of Reimagine Love Coaching for individuals and couples. She is a speaker and she's the author of Living for Love, Set Yourself Free from the Daily Stress, Worry, and Hurry That Wears You Down. Dr. Haywood works with couples whose marriage has fallen asleep or fallen apart, and she helps them adopt a fight-free, conflict-free relationship. They raise sexual intimacy and desire and become the best of friends and teammates. Isn't that something we all want? Her husband, Chris, is her business partner and full-time travel companion, and they travel the country as nomads for the last nine years in their camper. She's been coaching high-achieving, perfectionistic women and their amazing husbands for over 23 years. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> me, Sandy. You're welcome. I love the work you're doing. I think, you know, just to help couples really figure it out because so few of us have any role models or any blueprint for how to do this. So let's first go to you and your relationship. How did, how do you bulletproof your own relationship? Because you're a full-time traveler, you're in close quarters, you've been <laughs> traveling for nine years. 
I worked with my ex-husband and we actually got along really well and we were on the road together, but I'm curious how you make it work. Oh gosh, Uh, that's a great question. I mean, as you can imagine, it's been a lot of years of, of, you know, doing the work that we teach. I would say, let's see, some of the best things that we do, we go to bed at the same time and we get up at the same time. We go to bed usually an hour before we're going to go to sleep so we can just talk and chat and, you know, other things sometimes. (laughs) And, um, And that's a really, really great ritual. Our morning ritual is equally as delicious. We um, get up er very early together. We do all of our morning rituals, which include listening, usually listening or reading um, a spiritual book together, um, journaling. uh, We meditate for an hour each day, and then we sort of start our our coffee and breakfast together and uh, off we go. Uh, So we have a, a, you know, some of the things that we teach in our programs are a lot around, um, systems, uh, creating really great systems and rituals together. Um, I did business coaching for women for, for the first several years of my company. And I've adopted a lot of the business strategies into our, into our coaching. It's like you have a, um, a financially profitable business or an emotionally profitable marriage. So we like to do a lot with systems and Chris and I have created a lot of systems that have removed just so many opportunities for conflict and allowed our life to be, you know, really smooth together. Well, I love the ritual piece of this because people don't realize the value of ritual. Now, even when you have good friends and you both like the same shows and you watch them together, you have a ritual, Mm -hmm. like my son and I, he lived with me for many years after the divorce and we would have shows that we watched together and I would have another show that I'd watch with my daughters and it was Mm. a way to connect and coffee together. All those things really helped to kind of solidify the relationship. Uh, But I also like what you said about emotionally profitable relationships Mm -hmm. and conflict resolution. I mean, you know, I, I remember reading after my divorce, the Gottman books on conflict and how to resolve Mm. conflict and, why so many couples don't make it because of the way that they fight. And um, so, yeah, give us some tips on the conflict piece, because I think that's that's an important thing to discuss. Yeah. Oh, such a great question. Thank you, Sandy. So with the conflict piece, what, what we teach overall is we have we have two methodologies that help couples get rid of conflict. Like literally we want people to learn to outgrow their conflict. So often you hear things like, oh, you have to learn how to fight fair or pick your battles or things like that. And many years ago when Chris and I were struggling, we just really believed that, you know, from a divine perspective that marriage didn't have to include fighting or big conflicts. And so we were really just on a path to figure that out. So what we developed over the years was um, two models. One is four steps to talk about anything, anywhere, anytime without fighting or conflict. And then the other piece, which will be easier to, to speak to for your question, is around how to lay down your emotional weapons. And we have identified seven major emotional weapons. And the biggest one that we really help people, uh, couples attack first is blaming. So I dare anyone to have a conflict or a fight where there is no blame. Even if it's just like mentally, emotionally, you're like, oh, that person did this or, or even to like somebody pulled out in front of me and they're trying to kill me. You know what I mean? Like our brains just go in a, in a contentious um, direction sometimes. So when people learn how to lay down their emotional weapons, you literally outgrow the need for conflict. It's just not necessary anymore. Yeah. The blame is a big one. I just had this thing with my youngest daughter who is, uh, she has to be bi-coastal right now. So she's living in Connecticut here where I live uh, to work. And Mm. she has an apartment in LA uh, where she Mm. prefers to work remotely. And she had some friends who were traveling and wanted to stay in her apartment. So she said, yeah, figured out a daily rate because they don't know how long they're staying. And I said, well, 
you have a contract? Do you have any plan and as to what the expectations are, the agreements that you have, when you get paid, how you get paid? No, no, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Oh boy. <laughs> so they just <gasps> left. And um, she said they didn't pay me yet. And she didn't respond to her her email about getting paid. And and I said, did you have any agreement? <laughs> She's like, no. And she goes, but you know, what does she think this is? An Airbnb? Like if it was an Airbnb, she would have paid me. And I said, you're not taking responsibility for your part. Like you didn't act like an Airbnb. And I think that's what we do. We just look at everyone else's at fault. It's their problem. Yeah. It's not mine. And it's such an important life lesson to learn. Like, what can you do? to set the agreements, to take responsibility for yourself yes. so that you're not pointing fingers out to the other person. Absolutely. Oh, that's so true. What a unfortunate lesson for your daughter, but a good one to learn young. <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time to learn it, but I I hope that she takes something away from what happened because it yes. is it's important, not just obviously for her apartment, but for everything in life. You know, we have... Yeah. We really have so much more ability to have a better life where we could take responsibility for the part that we're putting out there. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And just even the little day-to-day -day things, right? It's like, you know, a really ripe area for couples to have conflict is around dinner time. And there are, there's just so many opportunities to, again, outgrow, um, those kind of conflicts, rep repetitive conflicts, right? Where you're fighting about the same thing on the same day each week. It's like, you know, we can take responsibility one by just saying, okay, I'm half of the equation, right? Like, how can I shift what I want to do? And then something like dinner time, we love to teach people to set up systems, right? Like every Tuesday is taco night, just do the same thing. And then it doesn't get to the place where, you know, if every day is systematized, um, it doesn't get to the place where, you know, it's like, oh, I cooked last night. I don't want to do it again. You never help me. Right. And how it just perpetuates when we can put, take responsibility and also put systems in place. Um, it just removes opportunity after opportunity to have problems come up. And I love that. I am such a systems person. <laughs> My whole life is run by systems yeah. and it's, it, I never was. And I think there is a misconception around systems that they're constrictive, that they hold you back, that they take away yeah. spontaneity. And I think that what people don't understand is that systems actually create the space for spontaneity. I would love to hear your yes. thoughts on that. Oh, amen, sister, 100%. And I hear that all the time, too. Uh, as you can imagine, usually there's one partner that's like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, do this system or be beholden to a system. Um, but really, it just, it makes things more smooth. So if you think about, we'll use the dinner time example, right? If there's a, if we're getting in some kind of conflict for 30 to 60 minutes, and then finally at the end, it's like, all right, we just ordered takeout, right? I mean, right there is 30 to 60 minutes with one repetitive piece of conflict that now you've just reclaimed five hours a week right? So like go for a walk while you're waiting for your dinner to be, you know, delivered. So yeah, it's really, really important. Your, your point is a hundred percent accurate systems, you know, e even thinking about like having your standard operating procedures for your, for your relationship, for your kids, it works so well and it creates so much space and again, removes a, just a million opportunities for fighting and conflict. Yeah. And it also creates stability and a lack of oh, chaos, yeah. right? I mean, we, oh, for sure. Kids who for grow sure. up in these chaotic homes where they don't know what to predict because nothing is predictable. And That's right. imagine, you know, knowing Tuesday night is taco night or mom is going to always be with me to do this and dad will always be with me to do that. And so yeah. it, it works well for everyone. I start every client relationship with agreements and permissions to do this, to do that. Here's how I work best. How do you work best? If we all started our relationships 
every relationship with these oh. operating systems and how do we how how do we communicate what do we do when we're triggered what do we do when how do we how do we deal with when things don't work out i mean i want to know if somebody's going to go need time for themselves and quiet yeah. time or if they recharge in other ways and yeah but we have to know ourselves as well as be able to for communicate sure. that to other people let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors this episode is brought to you by amazon music unlimited you can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts, like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. I want to talk about one more thing with conflict because I think a lot sure. of people say, that there are unresolvable issues that mm -hmm. people will never resolve. And so how do you feel about that? I would definitely not agree with that. I I mean, in my own marriage, we've never had something that was even, you know, I can't even think of something that was really difficult to resolve over, once we learned how to stop having conflict, right? But so much of that is our programs are set up to be about 80% individual work and about 20% coupleship work. So the the work that we do here is incredibly important, right? And um, along the way, we teach our couples and our individuals to create a um, a defining value for their, they might do it, you know, when we're first working with a couple, it might be like for a three month time period, and then it might shift. And then over time, it becomes something that they set up for a year. And um, one really interesting thing about conflict is that, and, and when people use their emotional weapons, it's to, it's to elicit compliance, right? So when we're fighting, the only reason we're fighting is because I didn't get my way or I don't think I'm going to get my way. And that can be a really difficult pill to swallow for people, but it's uh, fighting, arguing conflict. It is always rooted in me, mine, I. And so when you shift that around and you choose, you know, a, um, a particular value that you're going to run your, your marriage and your family on for a period of time, all of a sudden you're making decisions based on that value, rooted in that value, instead of, I want a new car, right? Well, if we pitch stewardship as our value, then we look at okay, how is how how is this stewarding our family? Is it steward? Is it a wise stewardship of our finances? Is it a wise stewardship of you know our time, our energy, or, wh or whatever it might be um, that they're trying to make a decision? And so there are just so many beautiful ways to learn how to solve challenges. But a big part of it is we have to do our own inner work because I take me with me wherever I go. And <laughs> if I am totally glued to, you know, th throwing a tantrum because I didn't get my way or somebody didn't agree with me, um, then we have, we have an issue. Right. And so, yeah, it, a lot of that resolving conflict is resolving our own inner inner stuff. So important to do that work. Oh man. And to have both people do that work really. And yeah. I mean, start with yourself, but yeah, I, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I, I, many years ago, I taught a workshop for on family values and mm -hmm. I had the families make a vision board, which included their family values. And so it was the same kind of thing. If the kids were mm. fighting, is this in alignment with our value system? You know, do you see anywhere mm. on this, on this board and the kids created it with their parents. So it was, they had the buy-in, which was so mm. cool. Tell us a little bit more about some of the other keys to making relationships work. Ooh, um, do you have a specific question or just, just, is that just a general question? Um, yeah, I mean, just in terms of communication skills, yeah. um, sex, mm -hmm. you know, just some mm -hmm. of the big key points where the people who have consistently healthy relationships, besides the systems and the conflict mm -hmm. resolution and not being, you know, doing your inner work, 
What are some other ways that couples have long lasting bulletproof relationships? Yeah, I love that. So one thing that uh, it seems that most adults have to be retaught is how to play together. We just don't see many people coming through our doors that are playing, literally. Um, Now, they might go out drinking on a weekend, (laughs) and that can be playful, but just like being truly playful and figuring out what does that mean. Chris and I bike and climb and hike, and we play card games and board games and You know, we, we make sure that we do something playful every day and not as a, like a a checklist or, um, you know what I mean? Like not something it's like, oh, okay, well, we got to go play now. It's like, oh, what are we going to do to play together today? Right? Like he might get on his bike and I'll get on my roller skates or, you know, whatever it, whatever it means for couples to learn how to play. We, we just have seen so much, such a turn towards seriousness right? And, and just in life in general, it's like, oh, you know, I got to do this and I got to do that. And I got to do this. Even, even like body movement for most people isn't play. It's an obligation. It's like, oh, I have to go to the gym or, you know what I mean? And so learning how to play is just a, a really big cornerstone and a beautiful space for couples to start. And once they start playing, it's like, it's like their heart opens up right? Like they have this heart space that opens up and it allows for more curiosity and, and connection to sprout. Um, Aside from play, we do a great deal of work, as you might imagine, around um, just helping couples implement ways that they can get connected. So when couples come to us, they're, they're feeling disconnected. They're not, you know, they're oftentimes not having sex or not having much sex. They're not able to have, you know, really great, beautiful conversations. So in terms of connection, we teach couples how to start focusing on um, appreciation and gratitude and right. So we're, we're systematically teaching them to implement several cornerstones that allow just another space to open up and another space to open up. And pretty soon they're learning how to be vulnerable and, you know, really share their, share their hearts again. And as you know, love begets more love. So as soon as there's like a little crack in the armor, because most, most couples come to us and they are fully armored up, closed down, shut down and, um, you know, one or, or multiple ways. And so it's just a, you know, about systematically like peeling back the layers of the artichoke so that we can get their hearts to come out open again. And, um, yeah, so connection and play and appreciation. These are just some of the beautiful things that we teach couples how to do. Those are wonderful things. I think everybody forgets to play. It is yes. it is such an important thing. I mean, I was married to a comedian, so play was a big part of my life. And, uh, yeah, oh, that's uh, fun. Laughter, play, finding ways to implement it. I, I think a lot of people think that fun is something that you schedule in when you go on vacation. It's not something that you can do daily and uh, it is so important. And then the other piece of just appreciating, we tend to look for the worst things in people. And it just is uh, such an important shift. I see it in the dating world all the time. The the red flag detectors, you know, let me see how quickly I can find all the things Mm -hmm. that are wrong with you. Yes. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It's so true. I don't work with many singles, but yes, I, I see that so frequently where it's like, okay, Sean, well, there's this and that and this and that. It's like, oh my Lord, you only been on one date. (laughs) Right. Or not even the date, like the guy who wrote me off before even talking to me. Exactly. It's like the same in marriage. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same in marriage. It's like, oh, that all they see is, or, you know, like a woman might see the clothes left on the floor or, you know what I mean? Or I didn't, you know, wipe out the sink, which I hear all the time. I did the dishes, but you didn't wipe out the sink. And I'm like, I get it. It'd be nice if they wiped out the sink too. And you can be grateful for the dishes that are done or the trash that was taken out. It's like, 
uh, we call it problem solution versus solution, or I'm sorry, problem focused versus solution focused. And the more you can train your mind to be solution focused, the it just becomes easier and easier and more natural to see the goodness in people and not just in your marriage, but you know, in your whole life, everybody has goodness. If you're looking for <laughs> things to be, you know, sassy about, you're sure going to find them. If you're looking for things to be appreciative and grateful for, you're going to find them. Yeah. I remember when I did the dishes for my mother-in-law, this was many, many, many years ago. And instead of thanking me for doing the dishes, she said, you didn't empty the drain. And I remember how crappy that felt. Like, just, yes. just say thank you. Just thank you so much. And would you be willing to empty the drain next time? Right. Right. But it's it's so easy to reinforce the good, what we want more of. And the conversations around the why, you know, I really appreciate that you took out the garbage. It just feels so supportive when you help mm -hmm. letting, especially men need to know the why <laughs> I think more than women. It's like, sure. you know, just that really supports me and it really makes me feel loved or whatever it is to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Sean, is there anything I haven't asked you that you would love to share with our audience? I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, Sandy, we could go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the one thing you mentioned, um, you mentioned sexuality a little bit ago. I think the one thing I might mention about um, sexuality. So we're, we're seeing just so many sex starved marriages where the woman has um, is feeling like she has very little desire. Um, and as you can imagine, this is a big area that we work on. And uh, in our group, I, actually, this month is dedicated to women's uh, sexuality. It's a women's uh, women only group. And um, what I might encourage is that most of the time women think that um, that their low sexual desire is about hormones and, or they're too busy or, you know what I mean? Like all, all the things that we hear, I would just encourage women to be, um, really on the lookout that there are, there are a lot simpler solutions to raising desire than like, you know, for, a, it's very highly overdiagnosed, um, that low desire is about a hormone imbalance where, Oh my gosh, I would say at least 95% of our clients that come in, the women that come in with low desire, um, we can support with just a few tools and they don't have to, you know, go out and spend all the time and money and resources on, on the hormone stuff. So I would just encourage women to be like, just to know that there are other um, resources out there and that rarely is it about it's not usually about falling out of love or even losing attraction, which are two other big myths aside from hormones. It's just that there's a, a couple of connection pieces most of the time that need to be sort of realigned for that space to be able to, to open up for women. Does that make sense, Sandy? Yeah, I, I totally hear that. I think that people usually overcomplicate things. I know that in my own experience with the women that I have spoken to who've been in long-term relationships who mm -hmm. struggle with this, I know for them, it's as simple as flirt with me more, show me that you're hearing me, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, don't make it only about sex, you know, when there is intimacy in other ways, it does, it goes a long way to yes. creating desire. So we often lose mm -hmm. that. I think that, you know, life, unless you're intentional, it's really easy to, to lose connection. Yeah. Oh, truly. And people are just so like, we've made ourselves so daggum busy that it's like those simple things, those easy things. It's so easy to just push them aside and be like, oh, I have to work more. or I have to do these things. Right. And so, I mean, that's one reason that Chris and I love our full-time 
travel. We, we made a commitment many, literally nine years ago, more than nine years ago now that our life would be very simple so that we would have all the time in the world to love each other and play together. And, you know, nobody gets to their deathbed and then thinks, Oh, I wish I'd worked more or I wish I was busier (laughs) in my life. You know what I mean? They, they wish for the connection piece. They wish that they had spent more time with their family or sometimes it's about, you know, doing something that was more meaningful, but they certainly don't wish that they had been busier. And so, yeah, to your point, these simple things around flirting, right? Like it's so much fun. We're Chris and I are 13 years in and we still are just like, you know, cheeky little kids sometimes flirting with each other. It's so important, but we also have to have the the space for it. Yeah. And create the space for it. So yeah. you intentionally created that space. Oh yeah. And so many people that they don't get off their phones, they numb themselves out in many ways. Yeah. They're just, oh. just really? not, not in the zone. Yep. And it's, we're all yearning for connection. And I think post pandemic, even more so, I think that we really Truly. have suffered from, from that, that loneliness and, yearning for touch and attention and it's what everybody wants it's universal so do you have any any final words of advice for anyone who wants to go on their last first date Ooh, last first date i would say be open-hearted look for the good no, obviously there's, you know, if there's something glaring, <laughs> you know what I mean? But look for the good in people. Look for, you know, what they're doing right, what they're doing well. Shift into that space that just like opens your heart and allows a goodness to come in, like cycle in and out instead of looking to your point looking for the red flags constantly looking for what's wrong or what might be wrong in a month or two months because we don't know what's possible anything is possible <laughs> i had no idea that a marriage like mine was possible if someone had told me that 10 years ago i would have probably laughed at him so yeah just just look for the possibilities I think that most people don't believe in the possibilities. And so they guard their heart and look for what's wrong. And that will keep them nice and guarded and not vulnerable and not get hurt, but also not have love. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Or stay inside of hurt. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, Sean, this has just been wonderful. And I, I love the work you're doing. Can you share with our audience the link to your website so that they can find you? Yes, absolutely. It is uh, reimaginelove.com. Very simple. Just reimaginelove.com. And that is also the name of our Facebook group. um, And that is for women. Um, And so people are welcome to, to find us there, join us there and, you know, learn about relationships. It sounds like an awesome group and come and get the book, the living for love book. I'm sure there's a link for that on your website as well. There sure is. Okay. And all the other links to Instagram and Facebook and everything will be in the show notes. Thank you again, Sean, for doing the work you do and for coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom with our audience today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Sandy. This has been absolutely wonderful. And thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. We would appreciate as many ratings and reviews as possible because it helps our show grow even larger and reach even more people. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application.